adaptation is adjusting to the impacts of climate change to reduce the negative impacts and harness any opportunities. So that means something like building seawalls or removing carpets from accommodation that is at risk of flooding and changing crop uh, pattern. The diagram in this slide emphasizes the difference between adaptation and mitigation. And it, it also shows the synergies between both of them. Mitigation refers to addressing the causes of climate change by limiting and decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. For more than two decades, the world was focused primarily on mitigation activities, and currently the vast majority of climate finance is targeted at actions that aim to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Adaptation is the activities that help us address the impacts of climate change. Adaptation is becoming an increasingly important part of addressing climate change because most countries are already experiencing the impacts of it. These impacts will increase in the future, even if mitigation activities are successful. And that's because of the vast amount of greenhouse gases that have already been added to the atmosphere. And then there's significant overlap between adaptation and mitigation. And you will find that many activities are, could fall into both adaptation and mitigation components. So examples of an adaptation is changing land use uh, patterns, uh, altering infrastructure, and altering building design, flood mitigation, emerg creating emergency response plans, and something like um, in, a, in an area that's prone to flooding, or even actually in areas that are not prone to flooding, changing um, from a concrete or asphalt surface to integrated um, interlocking bricks to allow water to seep down back into the ground. That's it. Those are examples of adaptation, building a seawall, for example. Mitigation activities, like I said, is um, renewable energy, creating um, energy efficient systems, methane capture and use, uh, improving industrial processes, creating carbon sinks. Those are the type of um, mitigation activities. And then there's some that fall within both of them, like green infrastructure, uh, power system resilience, creating sustainable transportation, building uh, weatherization, and water and energy conservation. Adaptation involves adapting to the present climate and adapting to future climate change. And so why is this important? Climatologists often use the term committed climate change to refer to changes in our climate that have already occurred or will occur, even if aggressive mitigation proves successful in limiting future greenhouse gas emissions. Committed climate change is a result of greenhouse gases that have already been added to the atmosphere. In other words, committed climate change means that the climate will continue to change because we have already changed the composition of the atmosphere such that the thermal characteristics are different than the pre-industrial era, and so the climate will respond to these changes. Also, some greenhouse gases have long residence times in the atmosphere. That means that they'll continue to produce a warming effect into the future. The second reason is that uh, growing urban populations are at a high risk. And Essentially, adaptation considers not only the physical aspects of climate change, but also the socioeconomic processes and conditions that shape the impacts of a changing climate. Demographic characteristics are a key influence on climate change impacts. The global urban population is expected to double from 0.7 billion to over 7 billion in the next two decades. Most of it will be occurring in urban slums of cities in the developing world. And that's why an area of my research actually focuses on informal settlements or slums in, in urban areas that are highly at risk of climate change. And most of these will be occurring within Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 
next, the urban poor in the developing world are the most vulnerable. Various studies, practically all studies, mention poor urban residents as the key group to build resilient strategies and programs around. They comprise a large proportion of the vulnerable populations that are cited by many World Bank and UNDP studies, among many academic studies, as key to addressing for taking a pro-poor approach to building resilience and sustaining social and economic progress and development. Next, the cost of recovering from disasters is increasing. The cost of climate-induced disasters is climbing rapidly and is expected to accelerate even more in the next 10 to 20 years as more and more climate change impacts take their toll on human life, assets, and livelihoods as well as on ecological systems providing enormous and multiple types of benefits to society that are not incorporated into national accounting systems or gross national product or gross domestic product. Cities are particularly vulnerable to climate change impacts because many of the world's largest cities are located in low-lying coastal areas or along major rivers and other vulnerable sites. And that's mainly due to their historic trading and political advantages provided by the location on major river or ocean commercial routes. Despite this vulnerability, most cities aren't prepared or equipped to deal with climate change impacts. Since they have not yet incorporated climate change adaptation and resilience measures into their annual planning and budgeting processes, nor incorporated them into their longer term capital improvement budgets for public facilities and infrastructures, they are ill prepared for and not resilient to coming climate change impacts. Costs for climate change related disasters are increasing. And this can set back development a generation or more. Climate change threatens much of the progress made over the past few decades in terms of improving the human condition around the world. Climate change is a fundamental threat to development, and if we don't confront it, we will not be able to end poverty. Climate change and global warming will have impacts on agriculture, food, water resources, ecosystems, human health, and these impacts will be far worse if we do not take action to adapt. In the words of former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, on a range of cross-cutting issues, from global hunger to global health, Changing global temperatures and weather patterns will inject a new element of chaos into the already fragile existences of the world's poorest people. Among the predictions are more famine and drought, expanding epidemics, more natural disasters, more resource scarcity, and significant human displacement. And this is why climate change is such a cross-cutting issue. Everyone from um, from homeland security, uh, military, uh, those in the medical field are, are, are going to be impacted by, um, by climate change impacts. But adaptation does have its limits. It's not a substitute for mitigation. So without mitigation, we will only be able to go so far. So when I started to conduct this study in the Philippines, I really wanted to uh, use the approach that Cody is known for, and it is the essence of, of the work that's being done here at Cody. And that's something called asset-based community development. Those of us who have worked in uh, development have seen a large history of individual, of really well-intended development projects that occur in uh, much of the global south and they're well-intended but they don't necessarily have uh, a lasting impact and that's because even if there is community involvement the community may not own the project and if it doesn't come from the community and the community owns the project the results aren't as lasting so asset-based community development, it draws upon existing community strengths to build stronger, more sustainable communities for the future. And 
this, these assets, they aren't necessarily um, infrastructure or financial in, in nature. They might be ideas, uh, assets might be the creativity of a group of people, artistic ability, music ability, um, uh, ability to write. It, it might be um, ability to strategize. So these assets um, are wide ranging and it, this is a matter of the community mapping out their own assets and identifying them and building on them. The other um, uh, component that I wanted and did incorporate this into this study was action research. And action research involves those who are taking part in the research to be active and equal members of research gathering. And essentially, it focuses on learning for social action arguing that building partnerships between university and community organizations can develop research programs that benefit and include the participation of community members. In this approach, both the academic and community-based researchers are co-learners, and there is community participation in the development of the research and its use for education and change. So it's a matter of essentially building, uh, br building a bridge between the academy and people who live the realities of the, the research that you're conducting. And so one way that we did that, for example, is we used video and video and, and photography in order to collect data. So um, this is a gentleman from the community. We, we gave him cameras and and also we did the same with children. They took lots of pictures, they took lots of video, and then we would uh, get together with them and ask them to tell us what the pictures meant, what the video meant, share the stories of, of the images and, and of their community and what this actually means for them. And this is all part of the, the data gathering. It's a matter of being able to see the community through an individual who lives there through their eyes. So I want to talk about the, the case study and get into that now. This case study is in Valenzuela. It's a population of 165,000 people within the city of Manila. Um, I have quite a few photos just to show you what it was like there uh, so that you can understand. Um, I'm using the term informal settlement rather than the term slum. Many people call informal settlement slums. It's my preference to just use the word informal settlement because the people who live there uh, ended up living on that land informally. They don't have formal right to be there essentially. Um, and because of that, they are at risk of eviction, um, and there, it's difficult to create long-term kind of roots in the community because the municipalities might, or the, the, the government might send in bulldozers to bulldoze or half of your half of your settlement. So um, it's it's really a difficult and challenging way to live, essentially, to put it mildly. So these are some of the streets, what it looks like. There's a lot of color, a lot of life, which is, um, I look outside and, and it's pretty white here in Nova Scotia right now because of the snow and it is beautiful, but the vibrancy and the color in informal settlements, um, it, it really creates a sense of life and vivaciousness that is, is really endearing. The um, informal settlements are extremely dense, so the properties are very close together. And that makes it really challenging from so many perspectives, from, um, for example, flooding issues. Um, when it floods, there's nowhere for the, for the water to go. There's no pipes or uh, there's no internal kind of 
infrastructure system that allows you to deal with impacts like flooding. And there's also, as you can see, between the, the houses, it's, it's very, very narrow. So think about a fire. There's often in many informal settlements, you always hear about fires that, you know, kill too many um, men, women and children. And many times emergency vehicles simply just cannot get into these areas. And as you can see, there's the um, electricity, the wires, they're very dense and, and sometimes they're also informal. Um, people run wires from one shack to another in order to uh, generate electricity. You can see here, think about the safety issues involved, uh, being a woman and, and needing to walk down these streets in the night if there's not much lighting. So there's, it's, there's particular issues for women uh, that are also make living in informal settlements very challenging. But this, there's a market there on the right hand side. Again, this just shows how people are trying to move around, but also you can see um, all of the wires there from the, the to generate power. And um, there's there's the occasional rooster walking around and um, lots of activity happening. This might be a street, as you can see, it's not exactly a, a paved street that allows easy access. And again, um, try to picture this with flooding. So the, the flooding um, that happens in, in this particular community is, is quite intense because of typhoons. And this is someone's home. Very often, people just use whatever they have in order to create um, in order to create their home. So they just gather gather material. And very often in Canada, I, I drive by people's homes on garbage day and there's so many things that people throw out here that um, would not last about 10 seconds probably in the, near an informal settlement in some African countries and well, in other countries around the world. Um, so another big problem is during these changes um, in in climate, and that results in you know increasing storms and and intensity of flooding. Um, these uh, electrical wires, it, it's pretty dangerous for people um, who who might be around here, and um, also with heat increase in, in heat uh, waves they can heat up and fires can start. But at the same time, people who live in these informal settlements, they do try to beautify their, their homes. So they will plant plants and trees and, and try to make their home clean and organized inside so that it is um, feels homey. Throughout our research, we had children following us um, I felt like it was uh, it was fun to to be around them, and they wanted to show what what mattered to them. So we spoke with a wide variety of people, many women who are actually leading the the fight against urban poverty and informal settlements. This shows uh, one of the streets with markets uh, where people can go and buy fresh produce. There's markets um, all throughout. It, it is essentially a city inside the informal settlement. And this man, for example, this is his shop and everything is clean and organized. He takes great pride in, uh, in his shop and he's just waiting for one of the local people to, to arrive and, um, and purchase something from him. Many people are very spiritual. Um, most people in Manila are Catholic, uh, so very spiritual people, very religious people, people of faith, people who care about their families and um, and create a lot of joy uh, through their religion and family events and traditions. 
So I'm just going to try to um, show you um, one moment. So this study uh, involved um, working with a local organization and and it involved the um, I'm, I'm trying to put up this link for you. Um, I'll put it up there in one second, okay? Thank you. I can do it now, Ashley. It's okay. I'll leave it to you if it's going to work. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this was the multimedia uh, we did in our um, creating academic publications out of this work, but this was one of an application that we created so um, anyone can see the work that's being done there and learn about the methods and it's also a goal for people who live in informal settlements elsewhere to learn from what people did in Manila and uh, so that they can maybe apply some of these into their own life. So I've shown you some of the issues, for example, the, the density, the uh, narrow streets, and before people can adapt to the impacts of climate change, which in, in their case, there's the increasing intensity of typhoons and, and extremely bad flooding. Um, before they can do that, they had to essentially uh, buy the land that they were living on. So this entire city was just created without any land rights. So at any moment, the municipality essentially in, could go and bulldoze the entire city. So this was, a, they w needed to purchase the land and own the city in order to then adapt to the, the vulnerability, the, the vulnerabilities that they were experiencing. So this story is told by um, this woman. This is Tess. Uh, she grew up, or she was born and grew up in this informal settlement. And uh, she's one of the leaders in making the changes happen that occurred. These are some of the women who are involved in this other organization that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and it is the, you'll see it up here, the Homeless People's Federation of the Philippines. So throughout this multimedia case study application, there are videos, and unfortunately, I can't, I can't play them for you. Um, this format, black, the Blackboard um, format, doesn't allow me to play the video so that you can hear it. I can play it, but um, you can't hear it. So we will share with you the a link to all of the YouTube videos, or you can go into the site later and, and watch some of these videos to hear uh, what happened from Tessa's perspective. So I'm just going to bring up the slide again. Okay. So in 2010, the informal settlement settlers in the community, they were threatened with eviction. If the community could not pay the landowner, which was a bank, 30 million pesos. And the residents then approach the local government for financial assistance. So that city that I just showed you, that everyone there was threatened with eviction unless they could pay the landowner um, the 30 million pesos. 
So, and, and the land over the owner was a bank. So just think about that. There's people who are, you know, 40, 50 years old who were born and lived in that community and were about to be evicted. So the residents approached the government for financial assistance and the government rejected their application. The government money uh, should not be spent for privately owned land. That's, that was the government's perspective. So they asked their congressman if he could help and they couldn't. So without, with desperation essentially, they Googled organizations who are helping the poor. So that's really fascinating too, to think that there's people who are living in informal settlements and we're all connected. There might be some of you listening right now who live in an informal settlement. And, um, and you're able to just go onto your phone and, and Google uh, organizations who are helping the poor. And the actual video that they had is on that case study that I just showed you. And that's where they found the Homeless People's Federation of the Philippines. And at this point, they learned about community savings. And community savings is essentially everyone um, making a contribution in order to create community savings so that they could ultimately purchase the land and prevent eviction and make their community safer and less vulnerable. So what they needed to do, they needed to save for the down payment to buy the land. So they saved a million pesos in one year. They started with only 50 pesos per month, but then um, the bank gave the community one year to make the down payment of 3 million pesos to buy the land. So the bank was the landowner and they said, in one year, you need to pay 10%, 3 million pesos, or else you will be evicted. And you need, we're only going to give you a year to do this. They saved 1.5 million pesos. And after that, the community then approach, approached this organization, the Philippines Homeless um, Federation, for a loan of an additional 1.5. And the federation gave that to them because they were able to show that they could save. If they would had no savings, um, homeless wouldn't have been able to, to help them out. But they showed that they were able to save as a community. And what they did was, the way they saved, they created a box that was shaped like a house. And all the money went into the, essentially a piggy bank, that looked like a house. And that continued to inspire them to continue to save. So then they were able to pay the full 10% down payment on the land. They were given the land because they had community savings. And so the bank now listened to the community because they made that down payment. So then with the down payment paid and uh, MOU with the bank secured, the Federation was then able to unlock, go back to the government and unlock the community mortgage program for additional funds. At that point, the land was transferred to the community association and government paid the balance on the land under the CMP. Now the community makes repayments directly to the government. They own the land and they have a period of 25 years to do so. So now that they um, have owned the land, now they could actually deal with some of the problems without fear of eviction. And a lot of the problems are increasing due to weather related events. And uh, these YouTube videos, I'm going to share them all with you at the end because they're worth taking a look at because it actually shows how high the water gets and, and how bad the storms actually are in these areas. So one of the first things they decided to do is something called reblocking. Reblocking is essentially creating wider streets, reshaping the way that the, that the city, the informal settlement, well, no longer informal actually, is laid out. And many people were forced to cut back their homes. So this shows some of the construction that's occurring uh, to the homes. 
there actually had to get people to buy in to chopping off a portion of their home, making it smaller so that the streets could be wide, wider. And uh, there's a couple more videos, sadly, I can't share them with this application. But creating these wider streets means that now police and ambulance are able to get through the streets. It means that they're able to put in some drainage systems, some infrastructure that allows the flooding to um, leave some of the, you know, uh, not build up. And they're starting this in different areas and it's expanding one area of the, of the city and then they'll expand to other areas. But it makes it a lot safer, uh, a lot more secure, and much less vulnerable to the impacts from climate change. And this is an adaptation type of a project. And throughout this, they also uh, created other, other structures, other infrastructure in the community that allows for social cohesion and, and allows for people to gather, a gathering place, there's a lot of crime in informal settlements. The youth from informal settlements are very subjected to, to crime, to drugs, to gangs. And growing up in an informal settlement uh, from the stories that I have been told means sometimes having a lack of hope. And a lack of hope is, is devastating. And this forces many people to go into to crime. And so a way of creating hope and, and, and working with the young people is also creating spaces for young people to go. And throughout this, um, the videos show it, but the flooding that would get extremely high, um, you know, up to a meter, flash flooding. Now this problem has, uh, has been alleviated because there, the streets are getting wider um, and there's better drainage systems. There's um, also, they're dealing with the electrical problems to help decrease fires. When there are fires, now emergency vehicles will be able to get in. All of these actions are impacts um, uh, adaptation type of, of initiatives. So the key results from this study, this project improves public health and safety through reduced risk of fires and floods. It enhances livelihoods. It's been able to offer jobs in construction and it protects livelihoods by keeping families near existing jobs. So very often people who live in informal settlements have to go away to, to find work and then they go back to the informal settlement uh, on the weekends to see their family or they might not get back for a couple of months and, and send money back. This, be, this is um, able to, because of the jobs that are created in this, people are able to stay close to their homes. And in many studies in healthcare, for example, it, if for example, the man might go off to work in a, in a mine somewhere and there's prostitutes in that area or they might um, engage in risky or sexual activities and that has been linked to the spread of HIV AIDS in rural communities. So um, being able to keep families closer together is uh, certainly a benefit in a wide variety of areas and some areas that are completely unexpected. Livelihoods could be further enhanced by planning alternative roadside trading places. So many of the um, stores that existed, like the ones I've shown you, the, the merchants, many are destroyed because of the road widening, because of the reblocking, which we need, which they needed to happen. So Creating other kind of trading spaces is really important to also improve um, livelihood creation. And the goal, I think, for climate change adaptation or any kind of any kind of infrastructure project or any type of community development project, I believe that that planners should be always thinking about how you can get the most bang for your buck, essentially. How can you um, achieve as many goals as possible with an infrastructure project? So if you are building um, a condominium in, in downtown Toronto, 
how can you incorporate all of the other elements of sustainability into that structure? So that means how can you um, create a, um, a site for to build economic development? How can you create an area for low income people to become trained and to increase their capacity for employment? Uh, how can that structure be um, contribute to climate change mitigation? All of these types of actions are uh, important for, for any type of development. So in this case, um, the streets are wider, it's safer, ambulance and police are able to get through in case of emergencies. Um, there's now infrastructure to deal with stormwater runoff, but also how can other goals be achieved? Um, for example, you know, building that, that recreation facility um, speaks to some of the social problems, but how can other livelihoods be enhanced? How can economic development opportunities be enhanced as well? This project serves an agenda for integrated and resilient neighborhoods since the reblocking plan is fully aligned to the city management plan. So every city has its a plan and within the plan that is based um, how decisions around zoning, for example, are based. It's based around the city plan. And so this, this project, it's integrated into the city management plan that exists. And it's interesting being a planner because every decision um, that one makes in a city, it, there's actually a reason for it. Everything from the size of the, the trees that are built down a sidewalk, if you have a, a tree with um, a narrow trunk, for example, it's, it's safer uh, than trees with a, a bigger trunk. Uh, well, good lighting is really important. How people move about, and there's decisions around how far away from a curb um, something should be. All of this goes into the decision about how, um, how a city is designed. The project also shows a high level of strategic influence by the poor on the practice of government and even communities seeking to replicate their success. So this is really important because it's uh, the people who live in those communities made all this happen. They did not uh, get help from the government. They were rejected by all forms of governmental support and they rejected from the bank. They started saving by themselves as a community and because of that they were able to increase their own bargaining power and their own value uh, according to government and the bank. So many of the people that I spoke with have incredible pride in their capacity to do that, their ability to do that on their own. Many people uh, have no formal education and they were able to learn things like uh, like finance, um, like urban planning, like engineering and negotiation skills. Many of them are women who didn't really have a voice before and throughout this project they were able to increase their own capacity and therefore their own confidence in, in being able to tackle other initiatives and now there there's a group that go to other areas other informal settlements and help communities um, who feel helpless who who I have been in meetings with and and men and women break down and cry because they are a threat of being evicted in a place where their families have lived for for years, for 50, 60 years, and there, there's very little capacity for hope. And so this shows that, that one is able to actually to do this. The projects also uh, advance collaboration between the poor and the government. So the government is now looking at the poor in a different light uh, as people who can really make things happen. Many people think that the poor are just lazy and that's why they are in this situation. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The, the poor are the, the hardest working people that I have met in my life and continue to work despite, despite very 
grim odds often. And the government has invited feder this federation to showcase their work at very high level summits in policy dialogue. So even um, world, world events like the COP events, this organization is invited uh, to the World Urban Forum in order to highlight the work that's being done in these areas to show that it is possible. The Federation's data also shows that the project's capacity to serve the poorest of the poor will need to be enhanced through innovations such as rental income ideas. So um, this is costing the poor money and they make very little money as it is. So there's other ideas about how to be innovative and the, the, the poor are incredibly business savvy, uh, very entrepreneurial, always thinking, what else can I do in order to generate income? Whether, so they cut back part of their homes, but many of them are, are building up and creating another level uh, and renting the extra space out and to generate income. And this is something that's interesting in, in Canada and elsewhere in the world. We're used to seeing uh, multi-level, multi-story structures or high rises. And uh, that's very uncommon in, uh, in informal settlement areas. So, but this is what people are starting to think about, building up and uh, in this extremely dense space and renting space out, or what else can they do to generate income? The project promotes equitable and integrated policy implementation by demonstrating how progressive policies can be implemented rather than only relocation projects. So government often thinks like that they need to absolutely move uh, a city because an informal settlement might be uh, located in um, an area that's high risk for flooding or a dangerous area the solution is very often let's relocate them. But that's not, that's not an easy solution because uh, first of all, this is where people have their roots. This is where people work, live, and just moving uh, someone, imagine that actually, imagine where you live and they just move you somewhere else. And there's no consideration about how far away from work you now live and you rely on, um, informal transportation systems often and there's no bus route and you might have to take four or five different buses to get to your work. Some people travel two, three hours a day who live in informal settlements to get to their job as a gardener or, or um, a house work, um, a housemaid. So um, very often just bulldozing over an entire city like that is not a very helpful um, or compassionate type of solution. And so this shows how being progressive and innovative really allows one to um, stay in the area and have better solutions for dealing with some of the vulnerabilities that they deal with. The project also should explore additional pro-poor financing instruments in order to blend different sources of capital for the upgrade. So in resilience um, speak, we talk about trying to diversify as much as possible. Essentially, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Don't rely on one source of income. Try multiple, uh, multiple avenues in order to generate income. And so this is one of the recommendations that we have. It, it maybe should try to start exploring other type of financing instruments in order to generate income so that they can um, uh, create more uh, upgrading projects. And um, essentially, outside of the climate and urban resilience scholarship, my personal takeaways about resilience is it's uh, it's a process. It's not an end destination. It's something that uh, occurs on a on an ongoing basis, and it's progress. It's not always perfection. It's not always the the end goal, but it it is a process, and it's not always easy. There's roadblocks. There's um, there's problems that come up, 
but it is really important and this is the type of attitude that I've seen in people who live and work and make these projects happen in informal settlements that they continue to move forward despite these difficulties. Resilience involves dealing with the way things are as opposed to wishing them to be another way. There's not much time for, um, for not dealing with reality as it is and fantasizing that things were a different way. There's time for looking at, okay, this is what we have, this is what we have to deal with, now how do we move forward? And there's little time for fighting the, once that decision is made, there's little time for fighting the reality as it is. Um, and you have to accept it and then move forward. There's also little time spent on blame and contemplating bad luck. Uh, I seldom hear people um, complaining about the fact that they were born in an informal settlement. And uh, when the bank uh, was about to evict them after people living there for most of their lives, they didn't spend much time blaming the bank. They didn't spend much time blaming the government. They thought, what do we have to do in order to be able to tap into these additional funds from the bank and from the government? What do we have to do to become an equal partner? What do we have to do in order for them to respect us in order to move forward? And so there's very little time spent for spent on contemplating your, your bad luck and there's little time for, for blame. It's an attitude of in order to survive, we have to accept this, we have to be creative and we have to move forward. And these are, to me, critical issues, um, uh, key factors, rather, for dealing with the impacts of climate change. The impacts are going to be wide, uh, wide spreading and create disasters um, that spread from, from how communities deal with droughts and fires and flooding and, and horrific, horrific things. And these qualities of having to cope in emergency situations with the way things are is, is going to be an increasingly critical component to, to making, to adapting and to survival actually. Resilience means collaborating with a wide variety of people. So, for example, when the women from the informal settlement who may not have an education uh, went to the bank and talked to the people in the suits uh, and were sent away, um, they could have held anger against these people, but they didn't. They, they did what they had to do and they continued to collaborate and be professional and be respectful, even though they might have not have anything in common with the other person and, and may not want to be friends with them. They didn't even think about that. It was a matter of what is happening, how do I move forward, and how do I continue to, um, what do I have to do? So a lot of taking responsibility for the situation as it is and, and being able to deal with things as they are in order to collaborate and to continue to work with people, even if you're on different sides of the fence. And acceptance of the rules is key to being a member of the game. So what I mean by this is they accepted that these were the requirements of the bank. They accepted that the bank and the government need a percentage down. And they didn't fight the rules. They didn't say that and this is not to say that there aren't times to fight. There are times, certainly, to um, to fight. But in but very often, it's important to just look at the way things are. Okay, the bank is going to require this down payment. Accept that, and then you're involved in the game rather than continuing to fight it. And and that's something that I think is really important to to their success. So overall, it, um, this study, uh, I think, really shows how, uh, how innovation, community-led uh, adaptation, using assets, using what you have, and being able to be really, really creative in, in the face of horrific situations. Um, I, I, I mean, if, if some of these people can create the kind of 
of positive lives that they do. Um, I often think that there's little reason for most most of us who have been privileged to grow up in a country like Canada. Um, we have to, you know, we have very little to complain about sometimes, I think. So, or we can complain, but also learn from the lessons from, from people like these, um, like the people that I, I've met in, in this community. And um, essentially, I think climate change actions, uh, being creative, being, being, having an open mind, um, continuing to, to dig deep when, uh, when things aren't working out as you want them to, um, and being really creative with various initiatives and, and looking at things holistically, being, in, being able to integrate lots of ideas, lots of different approaches, that's going to be key for adaptation. That's going to be when a community is hit with a, a hurricane and wiped out completely, that's going to involve communities um, having to come together, work with with everyone from healthcare providers to emergency providers to um, banks, to financing to governments in order to rebuild and rebuilding in a way that is is creates more um, more security for for the future and uh, puts one in a less vulnerable position. And also, it involves kind of looking forward, looking and being able to identify some of the threats that climate change is, is going to bring to us. So we know that sea level is going to rise. So what does that mean for the way we should be building our homes? What does that mean for the way we address uh, um, stormwater management? What does this mean for uh, how we build our roads so that emergency vehicles can actually get in when a disaster strikes? And so it really it means being able to be creative in, in redesigning and rebuilding our communities and our cities, our towns, and also how are we going to pay for it? And how are we going to make sure that people aren't left out in the process? How are we going to make sure that the poor are not left out in this process? And, and, and we look at each other as communities. So thank you for listening. Um, I do have a few minutes for questions if anyone would like to ask a question or even if you have any insights or let me know some of the projects that you've seen. Maybe you work in an informal settlement. Maybe um, you're in India or Africa. I know some of you um, are dialing in from there. So I'm just wondering um, if you can tell me some of the some of the things that you've seen. Anyone have any questions, ideas? Oh, Simi, can you, would you like to say something? Uh, hi, Corinne. Hey. Thank you for hi, where are you calling from? Uh, sorry? Where are you dialing in from? I'm from New Delhi, India. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation and uh, the whole uh, project I believe and I strongly feel that it is highly motivating and inspirational um, actually I um, I don't have uh, questions but I have a few uh, uh, comments that I would like to make okay, uh, uh, thank you so uh, one is uh, one is actually it's a question about did you uh, when you went to the Philippines uh, did you as a researcher have to face any um, any issues uh, while uh, conducting this primary research uh, from the government or from the local authorities and uh, secondly the whole um, idea of informal settlements and um, community development program it's so 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 similar to uh, India as if I felt that each of the photograph uh, has been taken in India is that so, right yeah yeah um, so uh, yes your thoughts on it and probably there and there are uh, tons of uh, community development programs going on in India and uh, um, uh, some are successful and some are not and uh, yes partly the challenges are uh, very similar to what uh, you have mentioned 
uh, so there is a lot of connect on those parts so uh, probably we, we could also think of something uh, uh, some program in india and uh, yes your thoughts on this yeah, I would love to learn more about some of the initiatives that you've seen, um, any any case studies that have been done. I think it's really important to be able to share these learnings with uh, informal settlements around the world. There's so many similarities that people are, I do, a, most of my work is in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and I could take this same issue and apply it to um, Kaya Mandi or Kaya Leach in Cape Town, for example. And so I think that it's so important to be able to to create these case studies in ways that anyone can access it. So this um, that the case study that I showed you, I'll just show it again here, uh, if I can be uh, one minute. Okay, so this a case study, the rebuilding and resilience. Um, format, people will be able to just use, go on their phone and look at this and actually hear and it walks you through the entire process and and this organization is, a, they're, on, they're online, people can contact them and there's another organization that I collaborated with on this work called the Slum Dwellers International and you're able to contact them and find out what other communities are doing in, in India. And I think this cross-learning is so, so important in order to help, the, um, help people come up with solutions. Um, and uh, I don't know if I'm back now. Yeah, so I think that that's really, really important to do. Um, and I'm also curious about any kind of projects that you saw. What have you seen? What works? What doesn't work? Uh, are you able to share any of that with us? Um, some of uh, the ideas that I have uh, which on the ground is, uh, is on uh, women empowerment and women uh, economic emancipation of women. Um, so that, uh, that is one area that I have closely seen. And um, this has overlapping um, association on uh, various other sectors like um, health and uh, family, the health of the family, and um, overall uh, political independence of the women. So it may be some project on um, in in the uh, far flung states in India, like um, like there is one in. Um, uh, Assam, where uh, the young women are bringing uh, health and prosperity um, by by producing uh, cheap and um, eco-friendly sanitary pads, and um, then there are uh, a few where uh, where in the informal settlements because it's so very uh, uh, crowded and. Uh, closed close um, surroundings so uh, how and yes open defecation is one of the problems that india is faced with so uh, the the initiatives that the that the local community are taking to uh, to implement the programs of the government but uh, not uh, you know uh, not very much is a uh, um, lot of help comes from the authorities and uh, it's the local NGOs that um, uh, can partner, but yes, local NGOs uh, seem to have their own vested interests. Um, so, uh, the, actually, the successes um, are most of the times overshadowed by the muscle and money power uh, in, in Indian informal settlements, I believe. So um, a lot of what you've, hi, nice to see you. <laughs> so a lot of what you said, yeah, it certainly resonates. And interesting, a lot of these projects are initiated and led by women. And to me, that it, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it, it speaks to the, the power and strength of women. And a lot of the reason is because men go away to work, they're, they're, and women are, are left home to deal with the issues in the community. 
and um, a lot of the creative economic opportunities, it's, it's women who are really driving this, which is uh, this idea of women empowerment. It, it's thread through so many of these studies. Um, and you mentioned sanitation. Yes, that is a huge issue because many of the, the, the shacks, they don't have uh, plumbing, they don't have you know, toilets inside like we would have in the West. Um, yeah. So a lot of the, the issues um, are certainly pertinent to, to women and issues like climate change, um, drought, for example, uh, the, this means that people don't have water and women have uh, different hygiene requirements than men. And so that's another way that women are really vulnerable to, to this, right? So um, you also talked about the, as a researcher, facing issues with the government. Um, we made sure that our studies were approved by the ethic guidance uh, guidelines in Canada, but we didn't, um, we didn't actually uh, have any issues when we met the politicians. We didn't actually go to the government there and ask for permission, um, but we came across many politicians in the communities and met with many, and there were no objections at that time. Uh, but I know in different countries, depending where you are, this certainly can be an issue. Is it an issue for you in India? Uh, in certain places, yes, um, uh, they would they would rather uh, not you know, because it would expose uh, any foreigner or any researcher for that matter coming down uh, to study or to take uh, take a look at the realities um, of the of the settlement and of the real situation. Then then they they are kind of skeptical that the real picture would be shown and then they would be in trouble. So they. You know, in several places, they try and push uh, push these uh, researchers, push researchers like us um, at the back foot, and then uh, um, it's it. And then uh, if there are female researchers, then they face other um, safety concerns, uh, uh, so to say. Um, I I know uh, I know what that's about. I know about uh, being a woman and researching and and risky and i i have certainly experienced that as well um these are issues that we have to plan for strategize and uh yeah well be prepared for i agree um i'm really interested to keep in touch so uh, it'd be great for you to send me an email and and maybe we can um share experiences or maybe um work on something together in the future and and create a a, a network of people who are working on this area and 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 I'm also really interested in not only you know I, I'm trained academic but I'm really passionate about how we can actually make a tangible difference so um so yeah thank you for that I'm gonna move to I think Fatima has a question what is next Okay, Michael. I think Michael had his hand up. So first, okay. anyway. <laughs> hey, Michael. Hi, hi, Corey. This is Michael, 2017 diploma class. Yeah. Nice one of your... Yeah. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for your thoughts and clarity. I, I really enjoyed your point um, with regards to mitigation and adaptation, yeah. and um, that also brings to mind. Uh, one of the things that we're currently doing in um, Nigeria, one of the um, the remote um, axes of um, the federal capital territory of Abuja, whereby yeah. communities are trying to build resilience in terms of um, um, solving um, problem of pollution and at the same time indirectly uh, addressing social issues. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of urban uh, poor, you know, that couldn't really um, solve their economic issues. So the community were able to bring them together in such a way that um, they, they, they form a kind of an association that was responsible for cleaning the environment, taking the waste and pollution, the pollutions out of the streets. You know, and in the process, they created a job for themselves. So they address the issue of waste management, pollution and at the same time creating jobs 
for Obampoor. So um, I'm looking at uh, how communities are coming together, not only in Nigeria, but in other parts of the world, are some of the similar examples you have shared. Yeah. You know, communities are helping themselves economically and socially, you know, yeah. addressing the issues of climate change. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's exactly this kind of multifaceted, integrated, holistic way of thinking about these about these problems. How can I, my, I, I need to clean up the garbage, but what else do, can I do? What other kind of goals can I achieve? Can it be a poverty reduction? Can it be a improving community health? Can it be um, combating climate change what, or dealing with the impacts? Can it be preventing emissions from going into the atmosphere? What can, how many different things can I do? And uh, I think that's fantastic. That's such a great, so who's driving these initiatives, Michael? Um, the, it's called the Green Revolution. It's part of the uh, the, the work that my organization does. So oh, what yeah. we do is that uh, yeah, we work in partnership with local communities. Uh -huh. And um, instead of the government taking ownership of it, we're able to bring the community together. So still the concept of the ABCD that you talked about, the yes. community coming together to solve their own problems and issues around um, pollution. I think that it's so important for these stories to get shared and to find learning what the steps are in order to make this happen so that people in other areas are able to learn um, how you how you deal with some of the, the challenges that emerge or, or how you deal with uh, some of the roadblocks that, that come up. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to find out more about the work you're doing, maybe write up some of the case studies, put them online so that people in other parts of the world are able to access it. And um, just, yeah, find out exactly how the partnership is happening. Uh, it'd be interesting to find out more about that. It's great work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I'm you so much, Corey. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to go to Fatima yeah. now. All right. Fatima, do you have a question? Your hand is up. Uh, let's see. Hi. Oh, you know? Is this Fatima? Yes, Fatima from Pakistan. Hi. Hi. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Courtney, for giving this webinar um, for all of us. And it was nice to hear what Michael is up to and what uh, previously I just have heard uh, the last part of uh, the girl from India. So I'm uh, you know, happy to know about all these initiatives. And I just wanted to ask um, um, just one, one thing, that how can we actually, um, you know, drive some um, awareness or maybe some, um, you know, understanding at the corporate level for, um, for climate um, resilience and realizing that how their corporate practices are, uh, you know, resulting in the devastating situation of the climate, uh, particularly in the countries like us. We are, you know, we, we, we are the country who have least emission, but we are the country who is being, uh, you know, drastically hit by the climate change. Um, so just because of our, our geographical location. So this is yeah. one thing that just wanted to ask you, and uh, just another thing, as as part of our our tries to do that, we have uh, in Pakistan lately we have just a realization about uh, the importance of climate change and this uh, and, and the issues related to it. Um, so what what started happening is in Pakistan that we have uh, we're, we're going to la uh, launch climate launchpad Pakistan as well. As uh, at the same time, we have certain organizations have started working on um you know organizing awareness sessions and at the same time organizing the uh, entrepreneurial challenges around the climate uh, uh you know problems and the the one such session is happening uh, next next month in Peshawar um uh, there are some other sessions that has already happened one session that has already happened in in Karachi and there are more sessions that are going to happen in Pakistan but still, the corporate partnership, the huge, the big corporations, they're not participating. They're not realizing that 
you know, they, it, is, it is important for them to um, to change their certain practices, business practices um, in in the country to, you know, improve the everything. So we've been trying a lot to bring them on board, but uh-huh. still it's happening. So I would just like to to learn from other other people in particularly from India or maybe from you to learn how can we you know bring them on board despite all our trials yeah that that's critical especially because of our our global economic system and how integrated everything is um i think i i i think that there is hope for this area i think that uh, we've seen incredible strides in in the private sector and their commitment to environmental and climate issues. There, we still have far to go, I think, but it it is getting better. And uh, the World Economic Forum, for example, business leaders are coming together, and a big part of what they're talking about is sustainable development and how uh, we're all going to have to reach the sustainable development goals, whether you're in the U.S. or if you're in uh, Pakistan. And we are all uh, responsible for climate change. So I think that that's one of the benefits about the sustainable development goals, because whereas the Millennium Development Goals were focused on the South, the SDGs make us all accountable. And we're all, it, it forces those of us in the in the global North to, to look at our own consumption patterns and how we're living and the, 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 the responsibility that basically lays on our shoulders because of causing climate change and uh, for many countries for example Bangladesh they probably don't have to worry too much about mitigation because they're not creating the problem of climate change they're really heavily focused on adaptation uh, because they're dealing with the consequences but many corporations are, are certainly well responsible for this and we all are as consumers and because we're buying their products but I think that there is more pressure on companies to, to do things better, to have better practices. And there are increasingly uh, very, uh, a lot of case studies out there that show uh, how companies have changed their practices in order to be more ethical, uh, environmentally ethical and socially equitable, equitable. And there's very little room now, I think, for companies to be complicit in this. I think that there is a lot more pressure on on even municipalities to have better uh, better laws and better standards when it comes to implementing zoning practices, for example, that that or environmental policies that many companies just ignore. And because I think because of technology, the world is more integrated, and we find out. Uh, quite quickly when a company is being complicit. So if co- if if it gets out on the internet that Coca-Cola, for example, is polluting the local river, or they had a fire and, ki- and that fire led to however many deaths, it's pretty fast that we're gonna hear about it here in Canada or in Europe or Sweden, and there is going to be a backlash against Coca-Cola. And so I think that harnessing that, that power that we have through technology, um, and other means is 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 really important and certainly a benefit to this globally integrated world that we live in. I know that there's um, there's some there's some problems with uh, living in a country where safety is a concern, like like in Pakistan. One might not feel comfortable necessarily going onto Twitter and complaining about the local company when uh, that company there might be some com- corruption integrated with the government or and one's safety is at risk. So that is you know certainly certainly a reality for many people. But I think that. Globally, there is going to be and will continue to be more pressure on companies. I think as consumers, we can always support uh, ethical companies that are 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 engaging in 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 better practices. There are um, I was in the UN actually has done a lot of work on corporate social responsibility. Um, there's been projects that looked have looked at and highlighted companies and and organizations that have altered their their practices. Um, 
and I, I think that there's a lot of different ways. There's certainly been um, the role of um, advocacy um, and, and basically essentially going to the streets and marching against the company. Um, but there's also collaboration. There's also developing relationship with that, with that company. And I, for me, I think that the bottom line is to show the benefit of the company altering its practices. So one needs to show the company that the, their bottom line will improve if they implement these types of practices. It's sort of like paying for climate change uh, adaptation or mitigation now or paying later when we have to deal with the disaster, right? So if you can show the company that they will economically benefit somehow by participating and, and just be strategic about how they can economically benefit because they, there's, there's some that may want to do things better for the sake of the, you know, doing the right thing, but very often it, it's about the bottom line. So indicate to the community, find out what they need and find out what their interests are and speak with the decision makers, get in the room with them and figure out how you can sell them on this because you're basically selling something. You're basically um, doing exactly what they're doing. They're selling shoes, you're selling more ethical practices. And so you need to speak that language to them. What you need to do is, I don't, is figure out what's important to them. Is it increased revenue? Show how your initiative will help uh, their bottom line. Show how what you do will help their public image and people will want to buy their product. Support that with any kind of evidence where it's been done in other places and, and there is evidence that's been uh, written up. There's case studies that show how a company's bottom line has improved when it implemented uh, CSR practices. Show how, uh, how the benefits to the government, if the, pollution, if the company stops polluting, the government will no longer be responsible for the cleanup and paying for the cleanup. Um, so basically follow the money, follow the money and figure out how you can convince the company and the, the power structures at B to, to do what you want them to do essentially. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, uh, this brings my uh, this brings my uh, first webinar to an end. Thank. Or uh, Michael, do you have a question? I see your hand up. No. Okay. Um, this brings my webinar to an end. I just want to thank you very much for, for tuning in. I guess you don't dial in anymore. That shows my age. In the old days, we would have to dial in to the, to the internet. It was before the high speed era. Um, so thank you for participating in this. I really appreciate it. And any stories that you have or any examples of of work that's being done in your country or how people are adapting or if you want to share other ideas uh, about how to deal with corporations for example as Fatima just pointed out how you've um, dealt with how research barriers have prevented you from incorporating action research any examples of asset-based community development when it comes to climate change environment or community development I'm interested in all of that uh, and how it improves public health public safety and uh, the the uh, livability uh, of a community for, for multiple people. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, I know it's probably nighttime for some of you, many of you. And oh, can I have an email where I can share the practices being taken? And in, 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 uh, yeah, I'll I'll put my email right here to all of you so that you can uh, send me any information and. Uh, I'm certainly happy to keep in touch. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. Bye. Just one quick note in the in the chat there, you will see a few links. Um, one to the site that Corinne had mentioned, and one to her playlist of videos. And then there's also a short survey there we'd like you to fill out, just letting us know what you thought of the webinar. Anyway, thanks so much, folks, and we'll see you again, perhaps.